Well, welcome back to Remote Sensing Applications for ArcGIS. This week we'll be working with a sensor called the Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer, or AVHRR. And it's basically a sensor that has been in existence since the early 1980s. So we have a long time series of data and it has five bands. So one band is in the red spectral region, another band is in the near infrared spectral region. So from those first two channels, we can make an NDVI normalized difference vegetation index. Channel three is for detection of hot spots typically used. And then uh, bands four and five are typically used for mapping sea surface temperature or land surface temperature. So here's an example of one swath from the ABHR sensor covering uh, Alaska and eastern Russia. So it covers a huge area and it basically uses a scanning mirror where directly below the sensor the pixels are at a size of about 1.1 kilometers and in extreme scan angles, the pixels are a sort of oblong instantaneous field of view that might be two kilometers by five kilometers, for example. Okay, so the AVHRR is on board <coughs> a NOAA satellites, and NOAA is basically ocean and atmospheres. So the sensor is really optimized for the remote sensing of ocean and atmospheres. And there's basically typically two satellites, one for AM passes and one for afternoon passes. And in Alaska, we have a high temporal resolution. So in Alaska, we could have eight to 10 AVHR swaths per day. And the swath has a very wide width of 2,400 kilometers. So we have high temporal coverage, we have large regional coverage with this sensor. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind is in order to get this large regional coverage, we have a huge scan angle, so plus or minus 55 degrees, and that's gonna create a variable instantaneous field of view. So directly at nadir below the sensor, the field of view is about 1.1 kilometers, but at the extreme scan angles, it's an oblong instantaneous field of view, and it's a very large instantaneous field of view. So that's one thing to consider when working with AVHR data. It's typically resampled to square pixels, but the instantaneous field of view from the original swath is something like this. Okay, there's several potential problems with working with AVHR data. One is the spectral bands are fairly broad compared to sensors designed for land remote sensing applications, especially the near infrared band. And the reason is they're broad is that the sensor is designed for remote sensing of oceans, which are fairly dark surface, and the remote sensing of atmosphere, so clouds is a fairly bright surface. So basically, we're, this sensor is designed not for land remote sensing, but for ocean and atmospheric remote sensing. Okay, another problem we have is there's no onboard calibration of the red or near-infrared bands. So there'll be some calibration drift that occurs naturally over time, and we don't know exactly what that calibration drift is because there's no onboard at the sensor calibration. So here's an example of the decay of spectral response from the sensor. So basically using ocean observations, here's the start at NOAA 7 AVHRR, and then in over time, the spectral response of that sensor declines. And then the launch of NOAA 9, and then over time, the spectral response of that sensor declines in the red band, et cetera. So basically we have this decay or degradation of spectral response and no onboard calibration that really allows us to correct for that via onboard calibration. So what we have to do is estimate this drift or degradation from ocean observations. Okay, another potential problem is orbital drift. So ideally, we would like the sensor to remotely sense the same 
landscape at the same time throughout the time series, but we have orbital drift. So here's an example of the drift for the afternoon polar orbitals. So NOAA Satellite 7, it started at 1500 local time in terms of overpass, but at the end of its lifetime, it ended at 1600. And here's NOAA 11, it started at about 1350, and at the end of its lifetime, it was passing over at the equator at about 1700. So if we have this orbital drift, we're going to have a change in solar elevation as this orbital drift occurs over the years. Okay, and there's an entire textbook dedicated to this sensor by Arthur Cracknell, the Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer. So that's probably the best book if you're really interested in all the nitty gritty about this sensor. This week we're going to work with a vegetation index called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI. And the basic idea behind this index is we have the red spectral region is being absorbed by photosynthetic material. So for photosynthesis, it's using the red spectral region. The near-infrared spectral region is relatively highly reflective by plant leaves due to the cellular structure of plant leaves. So if we have a high reflectance in the near-infrared spectral region and a relatively low reflectance in the red spectral region, the contrast between the near-infrared reflectance and the red reflectance, vegetation will be the only surface that will have a high contrast. So NDVI will range from negative one to positive one, and the only surface that will have a positive NDVI will be vegetated surfaces. So for example, willow shrub might have an NDVI of 0.3 to 0.5, and a dense birch forest canopy might have an NDVI of 0.6 to 0.8. Water, soil, clouds, non-vegetated surfaces will have an NDVI near zero or less than zero. So here's, so here's another example. We have a relative reflectance in the red spectral region and the near-infrared spectral region. And soil is relatively high in the red, and it's relatively high in the near-infrared, so it would have a NDVI near zero. The only surface that has a low, relatively low red reflectance and a relatively high near-infrared reflectance will be vegetation. All non-vegetated surfaces will not have that relationship of a relatively low red reflectance and a relatively high near infrared reflectance. Okay, so typically NDVI data from the AVHR sensor is composited data. And the idea is during a time period of seven days or 14 days or 15 days, pick the one observation for every pixel where the NDVI was maximum. So what that will do is it will minimize cloud contaminated pixels and it will minimize those pixels where the view angle was extreme and it wasn't directly below the sensor. And then it will also capture the peak photosynthetic activity during that time period. So here's an example from one pixel. This might be the instantaneous field of view for just one day. And all these pixels are contaminated with either cloud shadow or clouds. And then we'd have the same maybe 10 observations the next day, 10 observations the next day for a 15-day period. And basically, if we pick the one observation that had the maximum NDVI value, that would tend to be the observation that's directly below the sensor and it would tend to pick the observation that was clear. It wasn't contaminated by clouds or cloud shadows. Okay, so this week we're going to work with a continental scale NDVI produced for the entire globe. So we're going to work with NDVI for North America, and the pixel size is 8 kilometers wide by 8 kilometers high. So here's an example of the maximum NDVI from the first 15 days of June 
in 1982. And here's the next composite period. So the maximum NDVI the last 15 days of June in 1982. So basically that's the data set we're going to start with this week and it's called the GIMS NDVI data set and it's available for every continent on the globe. And then we're going to work with a one kilometer composite data set for Alaska. So you can access that for free from the USGS Eros Data Center and it's available as uh, weekly composite data or two week composite data. And it's available all the way to present. And it includes 14 bands. So we get the red band, the near infrared band, the NDVI band, thermal bands, um, cloud screening bands, etc. So that's what you're going to work on for the last exercise this week is Alaska one kilometer AVHR data. Okay, so if you go to the Blackboard website, there's some quiz questions there that will lead you to the next video session.